Welcome back. The hidden world is being revealed. That's what we studied in the first lesson. And of course, that hidden world is the kingdom of God. But the amazing thing about it is that this kingdom of God is being revealed and shown to us through quantum science, if you can believe it. Quantum science is opening our eyes to a world that we've not seen before. And you know, the timing for this is right. Jesus said, it's necessary for me to go, but if I go, I'll send another teacher who will come and guide you into all truth. And that's exactly what we are seeing happen right now. And the timing is perfect. There's a book by Phyllis uh, uh, Tickle. Phyllis Tickle was, uh, she wrote a book called The Great Emergence. She was uh, the late Phyllis Tickle. She was an author. She was uh, a religion professor. Uh, she was the, uh, she's the one that uh, founded the religion department, if you will, at Publishers Weekly. She was quite renowned. But when she spoke, she used this analogy that she called the 500-year rummage sale to describe religious changes that have come into the world and happened over the, over the years. She said that historically, the church world cleans house every 500 years holding what she referred to as a giant rummage sale, deciding what to dispose of and what to keep, and in the process, making room for new things. She makes her point in her book, The Great Emergence, by looking back over 2,000 years and uh, showing the, the great things that, that, that transpired at every 500-year interval. For instance, you go back 2,000 years and Phyllis Tickle talks about the incarnation of Christ. That was the first great, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. She said this was the great transformation. It was a time when God took on human flesh and we were able to experience Emmanuel, which means God with us. And as you well know, Jesus Christ gave us a new understanding of our relationship with God very different from the Old Testament, Old Covenant people's understanding of who God is. Rather than being an aloof and distant deity, Jesus Christ showed us that we have an Abba who's very close to us, not a God whose name you shouldn't even pronounce, but an Abba, a daddy who's very close to you. So the great transformation came first. Then, according to Phyllis Tickle, you move 500 years later and along comes Gregory the Great. And with him, and at that time, there was a big debate about the human and divine nature of Jesus. And the church then was grappling with, with the, the, the humanity of Jesus and the divinity of Jesus. And another big issue was about the status that Mary, the mother of Jesus, would hold in the church. So, you know, you go all the way back 500 years after New Testament times, and uh, the church was in conflict with each other. There were conferences and conventions and discussions and debates even then. Of course, you can go back to the early church in the book of Acts and the Jerusalem Council was one of the first big conventions and the, the big controversy there was whether or not Gentiles would be recognized as belonging to the church of Jesus Christ. So it's always been the case. On that note, let me remind you that disagreement and robust discussion and debate is not inherently a bad thing as long as it's done respectfully. But back to Phyllis Tickle's book, The Great Emergence. So the incarnation of Christ in the person of Jesus was the first great thing, the great transformation. Then came the great Gregory, Gregory the Great. And at that time, they were arguing about the nature of Jesus, his humanity, his divinity. And the church was trying to sort out what role and position Mary, the mother of Jesus, held in the church. Then, <clears throat> at the beginning of the new millennium, in the year 1054, came the Great Schism. The Great Schism was a time when the church split into the eastern and western branches that we still see today when you look at the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. So you've got your eastern and western branches, and this was in the year 1054. What was it that caused this split? What kind of big argument did they have? What sort of earth-shattering theological question was it? Well, it all revolved around what kind of communion bread to use. That was, that was one of the few big things they argued about. What kind of communion bread to use? Sounds almost like churches today in the 21st century, does it? And there was another thing they argued and, and dis, dis, debated together each other about, and that was whether or not the Holy Spirit came or comes from the Father 
only or from the Father and the Son. And if you look at the Nicene Creed, there are actually two versions of it because the church was divided about that. So there was the great schism where the Eastern Church separated from the Western Church. And then 500 years later in the 1500s, you would know what that is, I trust, there is the great, informa great Reformation, not information, the Great Reformation. The Great Reformation, of course, is when the Protestants walked out of the house to start their own party. <laughs> the Protestants left. It's, it's you know, the, the, the alleged date, nobody knows, probably wasn't exact, but legend has it that it was on October 31st, 1517, that Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church. And so Tickle, Phyllis Tickle, in her book, The Great Emergence Then, gives us these, uh, these uh, divisions of time over the, over, uh, since the beginning of when Jesus was born. The Great Transformation, Gregory the Great, the Great Schism, the Great Reformation that I just mentioned, and now note the last one, The Great Emergence. And that's the name of her book. What does she mean by that? Well, I said in, in, every 500 years, you see some cataclysmic thing coming into the church world that changed the church. And it changed the world, really. Go back 500 years ago, and the Reformation didn't just change the church. It changed culture itself. But here we are 500 years later. And what is happening now? If every 500 years there's been some sort of major thing, what is the thing that's going on now 500 years later? Well, I think that what's going on now is the emergence, the, the coming, the rising of the quantum age. And it is, it is the recognition that the quantum world is the kingdom of God and it is science catching up and saying, okay, we see there is, a, there is a world that is being revealed that we have not seen before. And I'll tell you, let me say it again. I'm not talking about the kind of Darwinian science that you grew up with. I'm not talking about Charles Darwin and that kind of scientific materialism. I'm talking about a science that has been discovered and being made more and more known since the early 20th century. It's not, science is not new. There is no new truth. But it was in the early 20th century that some of these physicists began to understand the quantum facet of reality. And they disputed the scientific materialists, you know, like the ones we grew up being taught from. And uh, slowly but surely, many of the scientific materialists converted, if you will, and switched over and began to embrace quantum science. Albert Einstein's a good example. Albert Einstein debated and argued against quantum physics for a long time. But when the evidence became so compelling that he could no longer deny it, even he switched over and began to embrace many of the elements of quantum science. So here we are 500 years later, and here's the thing that a lot of folks have a problem with. We're learning about the kingdom of God, and we're learning about what it means to be in Christ, things the Bible has taught us all along, but now, instead of science being on the opposing side, the new science, the modern science, cutting-edge science, has come alongside faith, and now science and faith are able to hold hands and walk together and live happily ever after. This is the new science. Nikola Tesla, you know Tesla, uh, you know the car if nothing else, but Nikola Tesla, he said this back in his day. He said, the day science begins to study non-physical phenomena, it will make more progress in one decade than in all the previous centuries of its existence. And boy, oh boy, is that the truth. That is the absolute truth. When science started studying um, non, you know, metaphysical things, non-physical phenomena, in other words, spiritual things, because if it's not physical, it's spiritual. And when science began to study that, it shook the foundation of the scientific world. We'll, we'll say more about this in a, in a future lesson, but the idea of science is not something that is all that uh, old. It's relatively new. We'll say more about that. Science as a discipline is really about 300 years old. Before that, they would have used different words to describe it. I won't get ahead of myself, but 
they called it theology for one thing, and it was just, or the way that God works in His creation, but or or, or uh, natural philosophy, uh, how God works inside of His creation. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. The point being, <clears throat> what you were taught in school, you know, scientific materialism. Uh, that teaching is not as old as we were led to believe. It's only been around about 300 years. So anyway, Tesla comes along and says, well, if science will study non-physical phenomena, which is spiritual things, it's going to make more progress in a decade than it has up until now. And that's exactly the truth. We are seeing great strides forward now in an understanding of the spiritual world through science like we've never seen before. And you know, this was predicted even in the Old Testament. The prophet Daniel in the 12th chapter of Daniel and in the fourth verse, it's recorded that God told him this, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, listen, even to the time of the end. Many will run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. Well, I'm here to tell you we're at that place right now. We are at that place right now where knowledge is being increased in a way that is incredible. It is incredible. A shift in human consciousness is occurring as we recognize as human beings, what many of us who walk in faith have always known, but many more now, even scientists, are beginning to realize that the material world is not the ground of being that we have thought it was. Our old understanding of reality is being dismantled and modern evidence is framing a new understanding of the nature of reality. We're learning more than we've ever known. There is a, well, he's gone now, uh, the late uh, Buckminster Fuller. He's, he was an invent, inventor and a futurist and uh, he created what's called the knowledge, uh, the uh, the, the knowledge doubling curve. Take a look at this. The nov knowledge doubling curve. Now, as you look at this chart, let me, let me explain what you're seeing. But Mr. Fuller, a, a scientist, an inventor, a researcher, a futurist, he noticed that until the year 1900, human knowledge doubled approximately every century, every 100 years. By the end of World War II, Knowledge was doubling every 25 years. Today, things are not as simple to chart because different kinds of knowledge have different rates of growth. But on the average, human knowledge is doubling every 13 months. In fact, according to IBM, the growing development of what they have called the Internet of Things will soon lead to the doubling of knowledge every 12 hours. Can you believe this? Look at the chart. You, you, see, you see the little man standing there. We tend to think that the increase in knowledge will continue to move forward and upward in a predictable way, like you know the, the line to the left of the little guy. But we're at the place now where we're going to see an exponential surge in knowledge. I mean, we're learning more now than we've ever known. The, the, Eric Schmidt, who's the former CEO of Google, said this. He said every, this is about Google. He said every two days we create as much information as mankind did from the dawn of creation to the year 2003. Let me say that again and let it sink in. Eric Schmidt, who's the former CEO of Google, said, if you take all the knowledge that was accumulated by humanity, from the beginning of time to the year 2003, Eric Schmidt said, now we're cranking that out every two days. So we're learning a lot very fast. And that explains, you know, why that, that makes this, this chart make more sense, right? That makes this make more sense because we're coming into a quantum age. We've moved from the agricultural age into the industrial age. And, 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 and now we're in the information age and the technological age and the amount of information is just exponentially growing. So, but the amazing thing is we're beginning to know that there's a lot we don't know. We're, we're starting to know there's a lot we don't know. Y you know, the head of the patent office early on, 100 years or more ago, 
uh, said really they should just close the patent office because everything that had been invented had pretty much been invented. <laughs> I mean, how naive can you be? And I mean, I remember when I was a boy, we looked up, we said, well, there are, there are nine planets in the sky. Now we know, goodness gracious, we know that there are gazillion galaxies and now who knows how many planets. We know now there's a lot we don't know. There's a world that cannot be seen with the eye. And not only physical, not only the cosmos, but there's a spiritual world that cannot be seen. It cannot be touched with the hands. It cannot be smelled or tasted. It's a hidden world, but it is a world that is more real than anything we have ever imagined. And it is changing the way we see things. Look at this. This hidden world is being revealed and in this quantum life that we now live, we see things differently. We grow. We grow as a species. We have more and more information, which gives us greater knowledge. And we change. We're not scientific materialists anymore if we understand modern science and believe it. This world is more real. The world we cannot see, this kingdom of God, this quantum world, it is more real than anything we can imagine, and it's different from anything that we've ever been able to imagine. Niels Bohr was one of the early fathers of quantum mechanics, and he said this. Listen to this. This was a quantum physicist in the early 1900s. He said, everything we call real is made of things that cannot be regarded as real. If quantum mechanics has it profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. How about that? This was a physicist saying this. It's different from anything we've imagined, he said. And as we go through this series of teachings together, this module, you're going to see how different it is. And you're going to see that it aligns with a lot of what the scripture says and a lot of what you have understood in your heart by faith. We're talking about an invisible, immaterial, eternal war world. A world that is created by an intelligence whose ways are not our ways. The Apostle Paul said that those things that you can see are temporal, but those things that you cannot see are eternal. There's a world that transcends and supersedes this space-time dimension where we live, and it both contains it and controls it. Until now, We've understood most of what we thought we knew about the world through science, but we are coming to discover that, as I've said, some of the science that we were taught is in many ways limited at best and faulty at worst. In fact, the scientific materialism that we grew up with has led us astray in many ways. The science of our school textbook was right about some things, but other things that we now know show that some of that was totally wrong. Let me go back to what I mentioned a moment ago. The, the English word scientist didn't even exist until the 19th century. Did you know that? So many people say, I just believe science. But the word scientist didn't even exist till the 19th century. There was no such word. The Latin word for science existed, but it simply meant knowledge. The word scientist or science as pointing to an academic discipline was unknown. That word was first coined by an Anglican priest named William, William Hewell. Until then, the study of how the world worked was done by, as I've said before, those who were called natural philosophers, natural philosophy. The others who studied how the world worked were theologians who had a real strong, robust appetite to know how the Creator designed His creation to function. So, what we call science today used to be a part of philosophy and theology. Science, per se, is relatively new. So, <laughs> you know, when people get all haughty with you about, oh, yeah, I just believe science. I don't believe the Bible. I just believe science. You Christians, you Christ followers, you're naive. <laughs> no, no. As we go forward, you're going to see that some of these old school scientific materialists uh, uh, who, who, who embraced a materialistic kind of science, uh, some of them converted. 
Some of them still, it's just like religious folks. I mean, when the scientists are the same. When they stubbornly hold on to their dogma, they're often unwilling to change. But some have come around and they have changed and acknowledged the truth of this unseen world that quantum physicists call the matrix and we call, Jesus called, the kingdom of God. All right, we shall stop there and continue on with the next lesson. See you then.